everybody. I see a few familiar faces in here. Thank you so much for joining. Um, let me pop into my screen share. So I am going to be speaking tomorrow uh, at in the afternoon, EST, about Pompeii and specifically about what's going on at Pompeii now. Um, Pompeii is a place. It's also synonymous with the event that, that made it so famous, which was the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79. Um, and it's also a metaphor, really, for any place that is frozen in time. I don't know that I ever even learned about Pompeii specifically in school when I was a, a child, but it's something I've always known about. And I feel most people sort of know something about Pompeii. And then going to the actual place is so exciting and extraordinary. But in particular, right now, it is uh, the most exciting archaeological site I think in the world because of all of the advancements and revelations that are taking place there. You may hear in the news, especially during the COVID lockdowns, there was a lot of news about new discoveries coming out of Pompeii. And that's the result of what has been going on for the past 15 years, which is called the Great Pompeii Project. And that is gonna be the this topic that I discuss in length tomorrow. Um, for those of you I'm just meeting for the first time, I am an art historian and my specialty is the Renaissance in Naples in Southern Italy. And I was a lecturer at the Met Cloisters, which is the medieval branch of the Metropolitan Museum of Art for about 16 years. Um, today, I lead tours in Southern Italy and I'm also a freelance writer. This is uh, my contact information. And if I see you again tomorrow, you will see that again. But I just want to take you through a brief, um, take you on a brief walk through Pompeii so that you could learn a little bit about all of the exciting things going on there. I know, well, if you're a nerd like me and you're a, you grew up loving Indiana Jones, archeology span and exciting go together, but maybe it's not a natural pairing for everyone. This is the archeological site of Pompeii. And what you see in this green area here are the unexcavated areas of the city. Now you'll also notice in this photo, all of these farms and building, really the urban centers of modern Pompeii, all directly around the site. So we can assume that underneath those places, there are also excavations yet to be done. But right now, the new excavations taking place are happening really just beyond the immediate known areas. And because of the advancements in archaeology, which really bring together science, uh, and, and medical technology, imaging technology, so many different applications and so many different um, disciplines of study. When archeologists are making new discoveries, they're able to put so much more life into that, that object, that thing, maybe a, a, the bones that are found um, because there's so many different ways to evaluate it. So just to step back a little, um, a few hundred years in time, not so far back as to the eruption of Pompeii, but the discovery of Pompeii. It was destroyed in 79 and it was rediscovered in 1738. And it was always sort of known by local people. Certainly there had been tomb raiders and people going to the site for generations who were digging into the ground and coming up with treasures. But this was really initiated by the Bourbon Kings of Naples. And this is the royal palace in Naples. Naples in southern Italy was firmly a monarchy at this time. And this is the this is actually the reason that Pompeii was discovered. It was the building of their royal palace at Portici, which is right next to Herculaneum, another one of the lost cities that was very close to Pompeii. They were beginning construction on this palace, stuck a shovel in the ground, and dug into the villa of the papyrus which is at the site at Herculaneum. And of all of the mythical libraries of the past, the Library of Alexandria being the most famous, the Villa of the Papyrus is the only actual library that, was, that has been discovered and excavated. In the 1700s, what they did in order to move through the volcanic material and discover the spaces were build these tunnels. And though the field, the discipline of archeology span didn't even exist at that time, and they made a lot of enormous errors, a lot of, I guess you could say clumsy work, but they also didn't know what they didn't know. These tunnels actually were a good innovation and are something that people continue to use today to move through the unexplored sections. As these excavations were undertaken and they found 
the treasures of the world beneath the ground, they began to move them into what was then a military barracks in the city of Naples itself. And after it amassed so many treasures, they just decided to turn it into what is now the archeological museum in Naples. So if you only have a short visit to Southern Italy, uh, this museum will allow you to see quite a bit. Um, also during this time, this, this, these are the years of the grand tour when the educated elite of Europe went on voyages through Europe and specifically to Italy with Pompeii and Pestum being the last two stops on this grand tour. And very often they were giant shopping trips where people were bringing home all of these treasures um, to, to Britain, to Germany, and eventually these treasures have found their way to museums around the world. And then there's a long history that continues, but I'm going to fast forward us all the way to 2010. Pompeii has been an active archaeological site since the 1700s. So much has been learned. So many world events have happened, notably World War II. And in 2010, the site was in a, a state of decay that grabbed public attention and became a real embarrassment for the site itself. One of the main structures, the House of the Gladiators, fell. And this now as Italy is part of the European Union, received a lot of attention. And there were lots of words that Italians are, are that use very uh, often when they're upset about their treasures being destroyed, which is the degradation of what's happening at Pompeii. And so at that time, the prime minister was Silvio Berlusconi. And so he appointed some ministers to attend to this and, and money was given to the site. But things got worse because of corruption. And this is a picture of the Villa of the Mysteries, one of the most significant sites in Pompeii that was very much in danger of crumbling. Um, this is one of the very famous frescoes from the Villa of the Mysteries. And here's one of the many corrupt officials who was put in place to try to fix things at Pompeii. Fortunately, a new director was put in place. And uh, this man, whose name is Mas Massimo Osana, has done a tremendous job. He's an academic. He was from, he is himself from Southern Italy. And he took charge of the archeological site with a very difficult mission, which was, which was with very little money and a very lean staff to try to turn things around at Pompeii. And what he did was usher in this extremely exciting period of archeology span we are enjoying right now. He created a title that he calls global archeology span in which he brought in archeozoologists, biologists, bricklayers, dentists, geologists, photographers, people from all of these many disciplines to evaluate what was on the site. And I think sometimes academia, Often academia is very rigid, but when you have a disaster, sometimes new opportunities are born from that. And slowly he began it, 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 attending to the site to its most famous structures. This is once again, the school of the gladiators that has been very, very well restored. And with an influx of money from the European Union has made extraordinary advances. Um, the cleaning of the frescoes at the Villa of the Mysteries, um, the stabilization of that structure, uh, the director himself began leading all sorts of tours of the site, including night tours that he himself would leave, doing really everything possible to instigate interest from tourists, but also from the international community of scientists and scholars to turn their attention once again to Pompeii. And they recently started moving through this unexcavated area. And right now, this is what's going on. If you are going to Southern Italy, if you're going to the Amalfi Coast, and you're doing a car transfer from Naples, you will pass by Pompeii and you might not notice it because you'll just see cranes along the side of the highway and assume it's road construction, but it's actually the, the excavation that's going on at Pompeii. So it's called Reggio 5. And one of the other reasons, which is less well known that this had to be done was that there were many what are called tombaroli, tomb raiders, who have been working in this area. Um, th these are two men in particular, the Itzo family, who had an adjacent, uh, have a farm adjacent to the archeological site, who they themselves had been tunneling into the archeological area. Um, Tombaroli tend to be generational families who have lived on this land for a long time. Many of them see these treasures as part of their own heritage, um, but there's a large network of trafficking in which people tunnel into Pompeii and sell artifacts through fences in Switzerland. So this was going on and these guys in particular had reached 
these really important pieces of Pompeii. And so they began needing to excavate in order to stop the Tomb Raiders in their tracks, which has been successful. Um, this is a, a fresco of Lita and the Swan, which was discovered just shortly before COVID began. So in my talk tomorrow, I'll be talking about so many, so many of the wonderful things that have been found. This is a, a fast food bar, what's called a thermopolium that was discovered. Uh, this is a, a, just for reference point what it would have looked like. You will see also the work of osteoarchaeologists who are just revealing the lives of people, their diets, um, their, their weight, their gender, their health, their, the diseases that they lived with through studying their bones, and also looking at some of these iconic plaster casts in light of the scientific revelations that have come forth. And stories that have long been told about them turn out to not always be true. And so these are all of the myths that we will be unraveling as we solve archaeological mysteries. All right, Seku, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Danielle, for a wonderful covering of that topic. Uh, just to quickly say, because someone asked, we will be posting links in the chat to these upcoming conversations at the end. So not to worry, you will be able to learn more. I'm going to pass things over to Demetra to talk to you about Santorini, and uh, I'll get out of the way here for that. Thank you, Seku. Uh, I hope that everybody can see my slides. It's already sharing. Thank you so much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to travel you a little bit further to the east from Italy. I'm going to take you to Santorini, to the queen of the Cyclades, one of the most beautiful Greek islands. You know it, of course, for the blue azure domes, the incredible caldera views, and it all happened because of what I'm going to show you today. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dimitra Pilarino. I'm a Greek archaeologist specialized in prehistoric archaeology of the Aegean, and I was very lucky that my first archaeological dig is actually in the site I'm going to be presenting with the title Greece's Pompeii. So for those of you who haven't been to Greece and especially to Santorini, a few words. Santorini is this island in the southernmost part of the Cyclades, the group of the islands in the heart of the Aegean Sea. Santorini is the southernmost of all and it comprises of five different islands. The two inhabited ones, the big one Santorini, across Thirasia. In the middle of the caldera, which is this ring of sea, we have the two new volcanoes named Neakameni, new burnt one, it appeared a few hundred years ago, and Paleakameni, old burnt one, it appeared 2,000 years ago, and the little islet of Aspronisi. So all of these five islands actually comprise Santorini today. The name, of course, is new, in terms of Greek history, it comes from the Venetians, the Venetian conquest, when they named Santorini after the church of Santa Irene. So what happened? This spot back in the Bronze Age world, 5,000 years ago, was already inhabited by hundreds or even maybe thousands of people. But little did they know that they had created their lives under the shadow of a giant in the beating heart of the caldera. So over here, where we have today Nea and Palea Kameni, the two very active volcanoes still, there was another volcano. But of course, the people back then thought it was a mountain. So they created their lives, they created their cities, but because of the eruption we're going to see in the second part, their lives were completely destroyed. Uh, the eruption happened, the entire island broke down in different pieces, and it was covered from with a thick layer of pumice going up to 200 feet in some locations of Santorini. So the site that we call Greece's Pompeii is actually located here in the south. It's called Akrotiri. And back in 1967, so it's only a matter of decades that this place was found in comparison to Pompeii that was discovered, rediscovered in the 18th century. It was in 1967 when this man, the Greek archaeologist Spiridon Marinatos, looking for clues about the catastrophe of the Minoans in the big island of Crete in the south, went there to look for telltale signs. And of course, little did he know also that he would find an entire brand new world completely encapsulated like a city frozen in time. You see him here standing on the second story of a building that is actually 3.7 thousand years ago. After he died, this man took over, another Greek archaeologist, and I was lucky 
to have him as a professor in the University of Athens, Christos Dumas, and he's still the director of the excavation of Akrotiri at the age of 90, still active and still sharp, let me tell you. So what is the amazing thing about Santorini? Because of the eruption, all of this uh, incredible material that exploded from the volcano that is actually 10 times more powerful than Pompeii, four times more powerful than Krakatau, and 24 times more powerful than the mountain of St. Helen back in 1981, uh, went through the roofs of the buildings, through the walls of the buildings, and kept everything intact. So this is extremely rare for Greek archaeology. So over there, through a method of tunneling through the debris, they found the entire houses up to the second or even third floor intact with everything inside as the people left it because of the warnings, of course, of the volcano. So over there we have frescoes that cover up the whole walls up to the ceiling, which is incredible. So we're looking at an area overall of about 49 acres. And of course, in the last decades, we have excavated only a very small part of it, only three acres. Why? Simply because in the small strip of land that has been excavated, we have uncovered 35 buildings. And out of the 35 buildings, only six have been completely or partially excavated. Why? Simply because it's too difficult, because you have a very thick layer of pumice to move and thousands of objects sealed inside. So we're looking only from one of the buildings, 14,000 pottery uh, objects, pots, uh, rediscovered. Just to get a small idea about uh, the importance of the settlement of Akrotiri, this is the strip of land that you can visit today in the archaeological site in Akrotiri. We're talking about an area that started its life as a small Neolithic fishing village about 6.5 thousand years ago. And after different earthquakes, it slowly expanded with the rebuilding of the local people towards the north. So the amazing thing about Akrotiri that we see an urban setting, an urban planning, a town uh, with incredible, amazing innovations already in 1700 BC. Uh, private houses, mansions of the wealthy people of the local community, public buildings for different kinds of uses, religious use, administration use, and even complex of buildings set around a main street a main thoroughfare, and in between they leave open squares so people and donkeys and loads can go freely without harassing each other. So everything was actually encapsulated here with the pumice of the debris. It's a city frozen in time. And as you can see from the photo, it's a very complicated site actually, so I would highly recommend to get a guided tour over there to explain which building is which and what we found in the buildings. And this is the spot where you can actually walk back in time. You go there and you walk through the ruins of a city that's 3.7 thousand years. It's not only old, it's also extremely fascinating. Uh, we're looking at houses built with stone and timber frame. The first anti-seismic protection in the world is actually done here in the Bronze Age Aegean world. Houses that go up to three and even four stories in one of the occasions. And over there, Everybody, and this is the amazing thing, had frescoes in the walls of their homes. So every house of the citizens of Akrotiri had incredible paintings, either of religious significance, everyday moments, uh, uh, ritual passages of, for example, the ladies that you can see here picking up the crocus flowers on the rocky landscape of the volcanic island of Santorini, and even incredible exotic animals. They loved nature, they worshipped the world around them, and this is what they brought back home. High living, almost 4,000 years ago, and even more than that, uh, very well arranged houses with storage area, kitchen areas, and even in the kitchen area every single time we find a fire extinguisher by the hearth so they can take out any fire that would happen to their precious houses. And in the upper floors of the buildings, because you always have a first floor, we have the living quarters of the people and the working areas where they worked especially with the loom, creating the incredible embroidered textiles we see them wearing in the frescoes. And if it's not already fascinating for you, let me tell you that here we have uncovered the first uh, flush toilet. 
Of course, all of these innovations come straight from Inon Crete. They are adopted by the people of the town of Akrotiri, and they're using private toilets where you can actually flush them with a system going all the way down to the main sewer system under the streets of the town, which is incredible for the period. And then after, of course, the demise of these people of the Bronze Age world, you have to wait until the Roman period, until Emperor Vespasian in 74 AD to create public toilets for many people to use at the same time. And of course, all of this incredible high living came to an end, to an abrupt end, when the giant woke up, creating uh, in an instant, in a millisecond, an explosion uh, similar, equivalent to 40,000 simultaneous explosions of the time of atomic bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 15 billion tons of pumice and ash went all the way up to the stratosphere, circumnavigated the globe for about two years before they come down as acid rainfall, torration rainfall that destroyed, of course, not only Santorini and the nearby Aegean Islands, but affected heavily Minoan Crete, Egypt, Syrio-Palestinian coast, and even now we have new finds from Turkey, from the tsunamis that hit Turkey over there. Uh, it was incredible. It was actually the biggest explosion witnessed by humankind in the last, in the last 10,000 years. It affected the climate, in many different ways, of course, that we analyze in detail in the seminar. Uh, darkness for days, and it even stopped the Greece, the trees from growing all the way to California, as we see from the examination of the bristle pine in California, and the Irish oaks in Ireland and Germany. They stopped growing after the eruption for about 10 years. So we have a huge global effect. But we don't have eyewitnesses. This is the problem with Santorini. We don't have Pliny the Elder writing letters about what happened, like in Vesuvius. But here, possibly, we can see uh, what people remember through different accounts. The tempest still of Ahmose of the 18th dynasty, where they describe an incredible catastrophe that hit Egypt. Maybe there is a reference in the ninth plague of Moses, the plagues that hit Egypt. Or even if we go all the way to China, we see that in the period of the eruption, uh, one emperor was decapitated because he was blamed for the very bad climate and the frost in July and the withering of the five Syrians. So they cut his head and they turned on to a new dynasty. And maybe this is again the outcome of the Santorini eruption. And I'm gonna close with this. Possibly we're looking at the story of Atlantis. This is the seed of truth, of historical accuracy that, of course, it was passed down after several generations all the way to Plato in 360 BC when he talked about an incredible civilization that was destroyed in a single day and night because of the wrath of the gods. And Akrotiri was destroyed in two or three days, not because, of course, of the wrath of the gods, but from the wrath of nature. So with this, I'll stop sharing. And back to you, Seko. Thank you, Dimitra, for a wonderful overview of Santorini. Uh, and I saw someone with a hand up. I just wanted to restate that if you have any questions about any of these three sites, please do put them in the chat. We will try to get to them if time permits at the end. I uh, can't, can't promise, but we will try. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to pass you over to our wonderful expert, Livia, to talk to you about Ostia Antica. Hello. Welcome everyone, uh, welcome to some familiar faces, welcome to my new guest. Well, I am Lydia Galante, I was born in Rome, I am an archaeologist, a specialty in, a specialist in ancient Roman uh, topography, which means I study the transformations uh, the cities went through in the different stages of uh, their history. And this is quite use, useful for uh, uh, every site, but uh, interesting for Ostia. And I did work in Ostia many years, uh, digging and exploring the city, trying uh, to understand the transformations this amazing, this amazing uh, city went through in uh, the different stages of its history. Well, Ostia. Ostia oh, a name from the site where it was built. Ostium is the gate 
Ostia was the gateway of Rome, but Ostia is also has the first part of the word os, O-S, which in Latin means mouth. It's a city, as you can see, built at the mouth of the river. So if in the beginning, it was a little settlement that controlled the salt spans. Salt was precious in the heydays to preserve food. Later, expanding Rome, Ostia became a very strategic place from where the uh, warships departed the conquest of the Mediterranean. And this gives us the first difference between Ostia and Pompeii. Both are Roman cities, but Pompeii was a, a little town uh, that owed its fame uh, uh, to the eruption of the mountain of the Vesuvius. So the life stopped in that precise moment. Ostia lived a very long life. Its first documentation is dated to the fourth king of Rome that is around the seventh century BC. And uh, the life uh, uh, was prolonged up around the seventh century CE. So uh, a very long time frame during which the city changed many times its skin from a military garrison at the mouth of the river controlling the saucepans into the military port, into the civil port. Rome conquered the Mediterranean and therefore all the goods from the four corners of the empire were brought here. So a very multi uh, cultured um, city settlement where you could find people um, that arrived as far as India and then Northern Europe and then goods, very exotic food and uh, logistically talking, that was an amazing place where uh, the food was distributed and then transported into the capital of the empire. But then again, it, ch it changed its skin to become a, a, a very fine area where uh, the Romans uh, built uh, their houses uh, for the summer, like the Hamptons, New York. Where are we now? Look, we are close to Rome. It's only seven miles away from the city center. We are now five miles from the seashore. So do not expect to see water in Ostia because the seashore moved some mm, uh, mm, few miles backwards because of the silt brought in by the river. And look how close is the international airport of Rome. It's only 4.5 miles north. So if you have a long transit, you might want to come visit Ostia. It's worth the journey. And what happened was here, you can see in this part here, there is the new port that was built in the second century CE by Emperor Trajan. This is when Ostia uh, lost uh, its uh, key role of being the river port uh, to uh, become uh, that uh, uh, fancy uh, place where the, uh, um, uh, the wealthy Romans went, spent their summers. And then, of course, uh, like Rome, the uh, late antiquity that is the end of the Roman Empire brought the decay, the collapse of the population, and Ostia was slowly abandoned to be rediscovered only since the middle of the 1800s. And listen, works are still in progress today, so I am going to tell you about that. So here you have a picture I took just a, a few days ago you see the beauty of the site. This is another uh, magnificent uh, um, point to visit Ostia. It's, uh, is, it, the site is very peaceful. Uh, it's incredible. Ostia is uh, twice as big as Pompeii, but uh, never packed probably because it's so huge, but probably because not many people know of its existence. And look the beauty. So you will walk along 
well-preserved road. You can get into beautiful houses. You can visit the condominiums where these people lived, the restaurants, but also the baths. You can see actually how the baths functioned. So why Ostia is important? If I should condense the site in one word, I would say daily life. Well, two words. <laughs> Here uh, you can really understand how a city worked, like Pompeii, exactly. Even if here you can see uh, uh, um, the, the changes in the society too. So Pompeii was high middle class, this beautiful domicile in Ostia. You can see, for example, these rare condominiums. Imagine flat apartment houses on a few stories where people lived. You can see here uh, uh, the wealthy domes, unlike uh, the uh, flat apartment houses on several levels. Here you see the um, one maximum two level stories uh, uh, houses. The, where the wealthy people uh, uh, received, uh, entertained. This is, uh, for example, one of the most fascinating where the uh, columns framed uh, the entryway from an inner garden that had water gushing, so a kind of monumental fountain. And all these houses were decorated with lavish stones, with frescoes, with mosaics floors, such as this. In Ostia, you have the, uh, the a very, very huge number of mosaic floors still in situ there. So you can see this, I'm showing you. This is a huge huge room that was a part of a, one of the bathhouses of Ostia, the Terme, and this is a magnificent mosaic dated to the beginning of the second century, and it is perfectly preserved, like many others. There is a peculiarity in Ostia's mosaic, you have black and white tiles, unlike uh, other sites where you have uh, colors. The only colors, colorful floors are those of late antiquity houses. But then you have colors in uh, the background of the beautiful group of love and psyche. This was uh, is located in uh, the house I just uh, show you showed you ahead the one with the fountain, and uh, this is a very cute group, but one of the few still in situ, because when Ostia started to be rediscovered, this happened in the middle of the 1800s, <laughs> excavations were promoted by Pope Pius IX, as Ostia was still in the possession of the Papal State, so was part of the Papal State, uh, not the Vatican, this will come later, whatever was uh, discovered or whatever was resurfaced from uh, the dirt uh, was uh, promptly ended promptly, promptly in uh, the museums of the Pope. And later, the most of what we can see now in Ostia is dated to the excavations uh, carried uh, in uh, the 1930s, uh, promoted by Mussolini, uh, who uh, was dictator in Italy in, in, in immediately before World War II and during World War II. And he wanted to be supported in his uh, politics by the ruins and therefore what better to uh, restore, for example, the theater of Ostia. This is the theater now, and you can see he uh, could appear like uh, the emperor who would munificence uh, offer this spectacle. Unfortunately, like it happened in uh, Pompeii, excavations were carried in, uh, in a rush uh, to uh, be ended very quickly or uh, better as quick as possible. And therefore uh, we lost uh, many information, unfortunately, but uh, today, uh, 
um, part of the untouched areas of Ostia are surveyed. One survey is uh, taking place right here in front of the theater, but there are many in progress. And what add, uh, adds value to the visit to Ostia is that uh, sometimes in the summer, the archaeologists working on site present uh, the uh, new discoveries to those who visit the site. So this is really uh, helping people to understand how we work and uh, which are the newest discoveries. And in the case you should come to Ostia uh, in the summer, between the end of June and the beginning of September, you might decide to attend to a play in the theater of Ostia Antica. And this is a picture uh, that uh, was that I took again uh, last summer. So you can see the stage being reconstructed and this add value to whatever happens on that stage. So truly a place I think you should visit also because it's very close, it's very easy to reach Ostia if uh, you do not take a formal tour, uh, which I usually suggest to take the most of it. Uh, by metro, you can reach uh, the site in about half an hour, and uh, you can really enjoy a full day here, which is uh, what I suggest to do. If you have only one day, it is uh, you will uh, invest better your time right here. And with this, uh, I, give, I will be very pleased to give you more information uh, should you be interested in my upcoming talk on Saturday. Thank you. <laughs>